if you'll pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we just, in this moment, I just ask that you continue just to be in the service, that you continue to be in the Word today, Father God, as we open as it goes out. Let it be your Word and your story and your love that they remember, and not my delivery, Father God, because it's about you. Amen. Who in here likes camping? Who in here? Wow, wow. Who in here goes at least once a year? Okay, okay. Well, maybe you've never been camping, but maybe you used to build those little forts when you were a kid. You know, you'd get the cushions out and the sheets and the boxes, and you'd create this, this shabby little fort that you could climb into and play in for hours. You remember that? Gosh, me and my brother used to do that all the time. And there was just something joyful in that simplicity of doing that. As far as camping, I've been camping went once when I was in the fourth grade, and it was with my brownie troop. Not really. I, not really. I went with the Boy Scouts, but I really wish it was the brownies because I mean, they had sashes and cookies. And, but I remember, I remember being there. And after they set up the tent, they said we could hike the trails alone, which I still find odd and very irresponsible. But nonetheless, five of us boys went, and of course I volunteered to lead the pack. So off we went, and there was curves, and there was cliffs, and there was waters. And as I came around one of the curves, I thought, well, who's playing that tiny little maraca? And there, coiled up like a slinky with teeth, was this big old rattlesnake. <laughs> and my eyes got so big, and I let out the most girliest, shrill shriek you ever heard, so I could take down satellites. <laughs> oh. Those boys, it was a long, long night. <laughs> Needless to say, I quit the Boy Scouts a few weeks later. <laughs> but the other thing that I remember about that camping trip is just how hot <laughs> and thirsty we were. Hot and thirsty. I mean, it was here in the valley. It was at Camp Perry in August. So, uh, yeah. We were thirsty. <laughs> now, keep in mind, this was the early 80s, so it might be hard for some of you to believe, but just like the internet, they didn't have bottled water. <laughs> they didn't sell anything like that. So, it, actually, they didn't even sell that till the 90s. So if we wanted something to drink, we would have to walk back to camp to get it, which wasn't real helpful five miles down the trail when you're screaming at the top of your lungs and running for your life. Not real helpful. We were thirsty but we made it. So in today's world, you know, we tend to take water for granted. We just tend to do that. You just turn on the tap and it comes right out, just like that. But it wasn't always that way. There were no water spigots in the ancient world. You couldn't just turn it on. Water was always scarce. In fact, in many countries, it still is. They don't have that luxury of running water like we do. They are still like the animals, in essence, having to walk miles and miles to the closest water source and carry it back to their village every day. Every day. And most of the time, it's not even clean water that they're carrying. They live in constant thirst and fear. I mean, gosh, you know, we, we see pictures and commercials all the time for children in Africa and other developing countries that are skinny. And they're dying with, with cholera, malaria, and typhoid, all from the water. And we see it, and we do what? Change that channel quickly, quickly. How is it that in these moments, our hearts kind of suddenly turn into a rock and they become numb and impenetrable and dry? Why is it that we can see those children and it not affect us deeply, yet when we hear the story about the dolphins being slaughtered in the cove, oh, how we're moved then. We watch the whole hour special. But you see, I don't think it's because like we're just bad people. I mean, I don't think it's that, anything like that. It's just that when we see something as humans that is so horrific and devastating and unfathomable to us, we just... We just can't take all that in. Our heart becomes a rocket, kind of protect itself. Much like when severe trauma happens to us, we do what? We block it out. Block it out. It's too much. I think the other thing that makes us shut down is the fact that the problem seems so huge. It seems so unsolvable that you can't help but feel small. What can I do? I don't have the answers or, or the means. 
It's too big for me. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. And so our hearts, they just kind of momentarily turn into rocks. But really, if we're honest, it's easier that way. It's easier that way. Even in our nation, we start to wonder if there's a thirst epidemic. I mean, there's dryness in the land. I mean, there's many people today all around you, and the people they love and their dreams have dried up in a sense. Just by sitting next to someone, you can almost feel their thirst and that need emanating from them. And you always recognize that. And the reason you can see it in them is because that same dryness is in you. And you always recognize something you know well. You always do. You see, people all the time are hurting and they're lost and they're in need of something. And you say, well, I, you know, I, I sure do feel bad for them. But, you know, what, what can I do about it? I sure do wish you luck. I'm going to pray for you. I mean, think about the people just in the last month who have crossed your path, who were hurting or were in need somehow. Think about that. Think about all the people, like the scripture says, who were weary and heavy burdened. When you became aware of it, what did you do to help? What did you do? Or, or did you do, or did you help? Or did you momentarily turn into that rock? And it makes us wonder, when you see people's thirst, is it them that's dry? Or is it us? What do we need for that, our rocks inside of us to be moist again? Now you've probably been wondering what all these leaves and fruit are all about. Well, it's not a mandarin salad. I didn't pack it for lunch. I don't eat some. But today, it is something that I've pulled from today's scripture. Now, today's gospel it takes place during one of the Jewish festivals, the Festival of Sukkot, which translates to the Festival of Booths. Now, what, what the heck are booths? What are they? And what's the purpose of the celebration? Well, the festival commemorates the time in which Moses and the Israelites spent 40 years in that wilderness. Essentially, it celebrates the ancestors camping in the desert. <laughs> You see, it was called the Feast of Booths because for the entire week to celebrate, people did not sleep in their homes, but instead they camped out in these little small tents or booths. I mean, they celebrated by living and remembering in these temporary dwellings, which would be all over Jerusalem, and they still do today. Those who live in the city, they would kind of set up a little makeshift fort on their roof, and other people sometimes would go out into the surrounding hills. Why? Why would they do this? Well, it reminds them that God provides for them. No matter how shabby life is around them, they leave the security of their homes. And this is a fall festival. Just as winter is coming in, they go out to sleep outdoors. And you see, these booths aren't very secure. They may shake a little in the wind. Their roofs may be open to the stars and the elements. Yet there Israel sits unmoved, unaffected. So it does, as they're there, it's kind of like the huts that they're in, these walls that surround them, is just like that constant protection of God and those provisions that He gives. And I think we all could use this reminder in our lives. You know, no matter how shabby your surroundings or how unsecure your situation may feel, God is giving you exactly what you need and He will provide for you even without your worldly usual securities. He will provide for you. And again, it reminds me of being in the fort with my brother, that simple joy. Something I heard this week is that when you have simple needs, then you always have enough. Okay, so why the fruit? This festival is also an agricultural one about the harvest. And it was celebrated then and now by the carrying and presenting of citrus fruits and plants. They would bring them to the temple. Now I kind of want to show you a quick snippet of some young Jews in Jerusalem celebrating it today. It's a beautiful night. We're looking for something fun to do. Hey, baby, I think I want to build a booth. <laughs> is it the stars in the sky, or is it these dancing Jews? Well, who cares? 
case, baby I think we're living in a booth Well, in my tabernacle I got everything we need for the show oh, oh. With my intro oh, oh. So come on now There's a foot brain got a whole lot of chains Don't you know, oh, oh. Come to mind. Help me just shout it out. <laughs> what words? Simplicity. What? Yeah. Joy. Simplicity. Simplicity. Treehouse. Treehouse. Yes. You see, it's that joy. It's that happiness. It's that simplicity. Happiness is simplicity. And do you know what the Jews? You know what they've called these seven days for centuries? They call it the time of our joy. The time of our joy. And you can feel that, right? So, we have Moses in the wilderness. We have fruits and we have plants from the harvest. Now, what do all three have in common? Well, the Israelites, they were camping out in the desert. And what ties this three together is that urgent need for water and God's goodness to provide it. You remember in Exodus 17 when they were in the wilderness and the people were complaining? Oh, I'm so hot and thirsty. Moses, you just brought us out here to die. Oh, put, just, just put me back in change. At least I'll have a cup of water to drink with my handcuffs on. Oh, I'm so thirsty. They complained. And Moses says, y'all, don't worry. Don't worry because God will provide. And upon God's instru instructions, Moses, you know, he takes his mighty staff and he lifts it high and he strikes the rock and pow! Water came out. Water came gushing out. That's the power of God. Oh, yeah. You see, it's water that is needed, which is why during this time of joy, they have this grand water libation ceremony at the climax of the festival. Gosh, aren't you learning so much today? <laughs> so now you know what kind of festival we're talking about, which is in the book of John today. Now, Jesus, he's still in Galilee, and it says he's kind of avoiding Judea because the Jewish leaders, I mean, they're trying to kill him, and he knows it. He's like, I'm not going there. They're trying to kill me. In fact, in this chapter alone, there are four references to his death, and there is three to his arrest, which is, occurs more than any other chapter in this book. And the threat, it really is real. So Jesus, he's there, and he's hanging out with his four brothers, you know, not, not his apostles, but his real life brothers and they say hey hey brother um did you see uh, that that festival's coming up over in judea you know what you, you should go you should go so all the people can see all this miraculous stuff that you're doing i mean if you want to be a public figure then, then you got to go and show yourself and no quicker than the period on the end of that sentence does this gospel tell us that these very brothers these very brothers who are encouraging Jesus do not even believe in him. In him. Ouch. So let me get this straight. I just told you I wasn't going over there because they're trying to kill me, and now you're recommending that I go. Huh. How many times does the word that your family speak not match up with the way that they truly feel? How many times do the very people that you love give you lip service instead of true support? How many times have you felt betrayed by the people closest to you? And how does that leave you feeling? I mean, hurt, void, <coughs> dry, you want to shut down, it makes you thirsty, and the more it happens, and the more those kinds of things happen, your heart becomes like a rock. 
like a rock. So go to the festival, the brothers say. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I cannot go because my time has not come. But it's okay. It's okay. Y'all go ahead and go. I'll be here. Have a good time. I'll be here. Or will he? After his brothers leave, Jesus decides. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go. And he says, I'm going to go. But instead of his usual clothes, he puts on a full cloaked garment. You know, with a hood that covers his face and it covers his identity. And he then sneaks off to the festival of booths. And when he gets there, he begins just kind of tiptoeing around, in and out of the crowd, listening. With the cloak over his face, just listen. And they're, where's Jesus? How come he's not here? Oh, oh, I don't know. I don't know. He, he's, he's a good man. No, 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 you lie. He deceives us. He deceives us. And this goes on for days. Jesus just listening to the different people and the authorities as they are wildly whispering about him. Finally, on the last day at the climax, during that water libation of this festival, Jesus, he makes his move. Flooded by this dynamic atmosphere of celebratory joy and underlying menace, Jesus, he steps out. He then pulls off the hood and he says, if you are thirsty, come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within. Now, this is kind of a continuation of what Jesus said to the woman at the well in chapter 4. There he said, I can give you living water. But we need to understand right now that that is not what Jesus is saying in this chapter. We kind of summarize it to say, I am the river of life. Come to me and I will give you living water to drink. You know, it's kind of how we summarize it. If only. <laughs> That's what it said. What Jesus says here is so far more radical than that. What he says is, if you come to me and drink, then rivers of living water will flow out of not me, uh, but you. Wait a minute. So you're, you're telling me that this living water, this, this well of eternity that quenches people's thirst and saves them is now coming from me? Get out of me. I, I don't want to be responsible for it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. How can I be the one to save? I'm not enough. I'm not enough. You see, actually, there's so much debate on this passage because ancient manuscripts and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the translation, and just to give you an idea of the complications of Greek translation, it says that the water will flow from our koala, which is womb or belly, which is then understood to be the seat of emotion and then translated as heart. But what scholars and pastors argue about most here is that depending on where you put the period, essentially it then shifts the meaning to say that that living water flows from Jesus and not us. And so much, you know, just like the people in the crowd today, they're all arguing and they're debating and quite heatedly, I might add, over these little details. It's kind of like we talk about the legalism on Wednesday nights during our Bible study. But what's clear to me from this is that people spend far too much time arguing about who Jesus is and not enough time about what he calls us to do and to be. I mean, but isn't that part of the Great Commission to go and save? I mean, today's verses say that this living water that Jesus speaks of is the Holy Spirit, which is why the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts 2. Now, I know there's not a one of those cantankerous scholars who would disagree that the Holy Spirit flows from both Jesus and from <coughs> us. So it's like, why all the fuss? Like, maybe if they spend less time bickering and more time ministering, they'd get it. They would get it. What? I mean, there's no doubt that Jesus is calling us. He's calling you to be a fountain of his living water. And yes, that can be frightening to realize the fact that people's lives are in our hands and that we can affect people. But what's, what's really frightening about this scripture is the notion of Jesus cloaked and tiptoeing around. What if Jesus was quietly tiptoeing around our lives? What if he was concealed in the corners and he was there as we interacted with people in our path. What if he tiptoed around our relationships and our offices and our social gatherings? 
<clears throat> what if he was tiptoeing around every thirsty person that we encounter? The rough question we are faced with today is would he see living water flowing from us? Would he hear life-saving words flowing from our mouths? Would he see life-giving actions flowing from our hands and our pockets? Would this sneaky Jesus, what would he see? Would he see a heart like a rock? <laughs> I told you, it's a frightening prospect. Here's the thing. You being his fountain, I mean, it can be a lot to take in, and it can feel like a, a big cross to carry. But he wouldn't have called you to it if he wasn't able to equip you to do it. And just how does he do that? Well, see, we must not forget. We hear that bold statement that it comes from us. But he says, if you're thirsty, come to me. That's not just it. If you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If we want living water to gush out of us, then we better start gulping it down like nobody's business. Because you need to be well in order to make other people well. It's those huge swallows of the Spirit, you know, that will guide us when we encounter people that are hurting. There are people all around us who need great things, and sometimes it's just a kind word or it's prayer, but sometimes it's big things. Sometimes people need somewhere to live. They need a job. They need emotional healing to unbreak their hearts somehow. And much like those hungry kids in Africa, those needs that people can bring to us or call to our attention, they make us feel small, like, like we're just not enough. Big things are in people's lives. But here's the thing, when we say we are not enough, essentially we are saying that Jesus is not enough. You see, you're not called to do it all. You're not called to do it all. Just your part. Remember, the scripture doesn't say you are the living water. It says rather that you are a river. <coughs> Bless you. You are a river to it. You see, your life and actions can be the river that floats others into that ocean of grace that can do the impossible things that you can't. That you can't. You can't save people. Only Jesus can. You just do what you're able to for them when they're in your river. And then you just point the way to the ocean. That's it. That's it. You may not be able to buy them a home, but surely you can afford shoes and some time for prayer. One of my favorite promises to God is when Ezekiel says, I will put a new spirit in you, and I will remove from your heart a heart of stone and give you that heart of flesh. You see, our hearts feel dried up like a rock sometimes. But remember, Moses struck the rock. Life-giving water came out. And then Jesus, the cornerstone, was struck on the cross. Pierced. Living water came out. So it is my prayer today that upon hearing of this word, that our hearts too will be struck. Pow. So that living water can flow again to people. To open up that kindness and realize we don't have to solve it all. You know, I, I read a story about a girl who wrote... Um, she would go into her college university and they would kind of, um, on the bathroom wall stall, they would write all these horrifying life experiences that had happened to them. And she would read them over the year there during school. But she said one day she walked in and there was a piece of, of paper that was hanging from it. It was handwritten notebook paper and, and it was just, just hanging there and you can actually see it here. Somebody had replied. The actual letter reads, To the girl who was raped, You are strong. I cannot fathom the pain you must have gone through. The fact that you have the bravery to even write it gives me hope. To the girl with eating disorders, I promise you, although I don't know you, that you are beautiful. That you deserve health. That you deserve freedom from that. To the girl with the alcoholic father, I am so sorry for that agony it must cause. To the girl whose father died, missing them never goes away. The ache of their presence is never gone away, but the love that they had and the memories you share surely must last. I am sure, out of the bottom of my heart, that the people who left you in this world are exceptionally proud of the person you are. Every time I see these walls, these confessions, I feel so blessed to know I have the privilege of seeing them. 
your moments and your secrets are all precious, even though they are sad. To all of you, including those I did not mention and those that have not yet written, you are worthy. You are strong. You are brave. You are loved. Somebody cares. Somebody cares. You don't have to be the ocean, just the river. 